with us this morning is the former Speaker of the House and one of the smartest guys I know, uh, a historian in, in America. We have uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich. Good morning, uh, Newt. How are you this morning? Well, it's great. It's always great to be with you, John, and to have a chance to talk about what's going on. And uh, this has certainly been a fairly strange week in Washington. Uh, it's just amazing. The um, you know, we, on the one hand, in a serious way, you have amazing things happening in the economy, where you have big corporations giving out thousand dollar bonuses, saying it's directly a result of the Republican tax cuts. Uh, on the other hand, you have all this noise about. Uh, Michael Wolf's book and Steve Bannon and all that stuff. So there's this kind of remarkable, um, well, I describe it as the Kardashian effect. I mean, you have you have weird things like the, like the Bannon Wolf story, and then under it you have this, uh, which you know as a businessman, this continuing economic growth that is just amazing. The consumer confidence is at an all time high. Business people's confidence is at an all time high. Um, bankers, all-time high, um, and the which the VIX index, which shows negativity amongst business people, all-time low. So, you know, what, you know there's there's, some, there, there's something that happened um, with Trump because I, that I think the the news media never understood. Trump is a real businessman, as you know. And he thinks and talks like a businessman. And when I talk to business people, <clears throat> they're just they're happy to have somebody who respects what it takes to go and earn a living and hire people and create jobs. Uh, and I think it has given them a real boost of morale, such as you and I have not seen in our lifetime. I mean, this is really a remarkable uh, resurrection of the idea that creating jobs is good, uh, having a business that creates jobs is good. The deregulation, where Trump clearly is the, the the most successful guy, cutting red tape in Washington in American history. Uh, the tax cuts, I think, are already beginning to have an effect psychologically, and uh, his attitude, which is, you know, he wants to represent America, he wants to get good trade deals. Uh, when he goes overseas, he tries to find uh, things that countries want to buy from us. So. He got, I think, $400 billion in contracts when he was in Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's really an amazing boost to our economy, and you see it happening with people's spirits. I mean, <clears throat> they're getting more optimistic. They're getting more positive. They're getting more willing to do the kind of things that work. So it becomes sort of a reinforcing virtuous circle. And he doesn't want to give foreign aid to a country that doesn't want to help America. Oh, I know. It, it has just so thoroughly shocked the elites that we actually are going to protect America and defend America, and that we're actually going to render judgment that you know if you uh, if you kick us in the shin, we're not going to pay you. And uh, that is such a shocking moment for a lot of our elites that they don't know how to deal with it. And, and the business people, uh, Newt, uh, they feel like, well, we're no longer the enemy of Washington, and that's why they're spending money. I think that's right. I think they feel psychologically renewed, and 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 just having somebody who respects them. Uh, you may remember Obama at one point told this guy, you know, you may think you you achieved all that, but you didn't really achieve all that. And the guy just stared at him like he was nuts. Uh, but Obama had this this uh, school teacher contempt for people who create jobs and who earn a living and who run businesses, and people could feel it. Uh, and then he appointed people to things like the Consumer Finance Protection Agency, who are really deeply, bitterly anti-business and, and uh, willing to impose, use the power of government. And, and so people sort of shrank. Uh, and that's why you had for eight years the lowest rate of economic growth, I think, of any president uh, in American history. I mean, lower than the eight years of the Great Depression. And, and nobody accepted it that way. And all of a sudden... They tried to say that was the new norm, and all of a sudden uh, Trump has it back up to three percent, three and a half percent, four percent, and they say, "Holy cow! How did that happen?" That's right. And I just saw some numbers that came out today. I think we had the lowest number of people who were laid off since 1990. Uh, you know, so you have job creation underway. You have companies beginning to raise pay because. 
uh, they're doing better and the market's getting better for labor and people have more choices. As, as Trump said the other day, he doesn't just want to have a job for people. He wants them to have a choice of three or four or five or six jobs. Uh, and that's what a really booming economy could be like. Uh, you've been in Italy for the last few weeks, and uh, your wife is the new ambassador to the Vatican. Tell us your experience about that. Well, it was just remarkable. Um, Callista was was born and raised as a Catholic in a very small town in Wisconsin, about 1,500 people called Whitehall. And the idea that a, that a, a girl from a St. John's Church in Whitehall would end up having a personal private conversation with the Pope uh, was just remarkable. Uh, she was received at the Vatican. Uh, we all went in and got a picture made of the Pope, and then he and Callisto went down the hall uh, with an interpreter, just the three of them, and for about 25 minutes they had a really serious, deep conversation. Then we went over and saw Cardinal Perelin, who was the number two guy who actually runs the Vatican, and had a great conversation. Uh, and... Um, you know, watching her just blossom as the ambassador, she she loves representing the United States. Uh, she she feels close to, to President Trump and is grateful to him. She's known Mike Pence. Uh, when Pence came to Congress years ago, he was as a freshman in the House Agriculture Committee, and she was the chief clerk. They literally sat next to each other uh, for his freshman term. So she's really had a long, deep personal relationship uh, with Pence, and she feels it's such an honor to represent the United States, and of course a particular honor to represent the United States uh, to the Holy See and to the, uh, the Pope, uh, that it, she's really uh, deeply immersed in it and, and doing a great job. And I'm just very proud of her as, as her husband. The State Department has a term, uh, they call it the trailing spouse, uh, and that's exactly what happened. When, you know, when she walked in to be accepted and credentialed, I was behind her uh, because she's the ambassador. And so I trailed, uh, and it was... It was <laughs> It, it was great fun. It's, it's a, one of the great uh, memories of my life, and it's a joy to watch her blossom in this new job. And uh, she's working her heart out. I mean, she's deeply committed on the issue of human trafficking, a, a terrible, tragic problem that we're faced with, uh, deeply committed on religious liberty and the, and the survival of Christians in the Middle East, uh, and uh, wants to work very much on how we make sure that, that people who are in, in, in terrible situations like South Sudan, how do we get aid to them, keep them from starving to death? So it's a, it's a great job for her, and I think she's going to do a good job for America. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you have a new project, I understand. You want to tell America about your new project? Well, I'm working very much on, on uh, developing uh, a film and, and an entire uh, uh, radio program around one of the most interesting issues um, in American history that almost nobody knows about. Um, the British, during the American Revolutionary War, uh, developed prison ships in New York Harbor. And ultimately, uh, if, if you were captured by the British in one of the battles, you ended up on these prison ships. More people died on these prison ships for liberty than died in all the battles of the Revolutionary War. And yet, this whole story has not really gotten the attention it deserves uh, there's a very small monument in Brooklyn, uh, and we're looking at how do we bring it alive? How, how do we get people to realize that there were Americans willing to die on a prison ship in the name of liberty, and that sometimes when we get in arguments about the flag or the national anthem uh, or patriotism, that we need to remember uh, what what extraordinary prices people paid. And so this whole issue of... of uh, really getting the American people. It builds on something you helped us with uh, two years ago, which is a terrific film on George Washington called The First American. Again, trying to communicate patriotism and American history, and, and uh, it's very exciting. And uh, By the way, you, you'll be fascinated. Uh, we um, have just launched on Facebook a, a project called What If, which is alternative histories where we take a topic like what if Lee had won at Gettysburg, or what if Clinton, Hillary Clinton had won the election? And we, and we spent about seven or eight minutes talking about what that alternative world would have been like. And uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, and it's very, very interesting. Wow. Uh, and how soon do you think we can get that done? 
Well, we, we actually have it up and running now. If you're talking about the, the, the prison ship story, I think it'll probably, we hope to be able to have it up uh, this summer. I'm going to come to New York and talk to people and see if we can put together the resources because it is such a powerful emotional story that it really deserves to be understood. I'd like to be able to do it in a way that every school in America had a movie that described uh, what the, what we were willing, what people were willing to sacrifice in order to be free and why we should cherish. The younger generation needs to be reminded that, that cherishing freedom and protecting freedom is really central if you are going to give your children and grandchildren freedom. Mr. Speaker, thank you for calling in this Sunday morning, and uh, thank you for everything you do for all America. Well, and you continue continue to do John, for John, it's, it's, it's always great to, to be with you, and I, I hope uh, in the future to be able to report on Costa's continued adventures in the Vatican. I, I look forward to it, and any time she'd like to come on and talk to the American people, we'd love to have her. Great. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. This is the Cats Roundtable. We'll be right back.